This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the friends of KUHF Houston. Today, let's meet the first black woman to fly. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. It should be no surprise that the first two black Americans to win flying licenses did so under unusual circumstances. First was Eugene Bullard. He joined the French Foreign Legion during World War I. Then he managed to transfer to the French Flying Service. But the more remarkable tale is that of Bessie Coleman. Coleman was born in 1896, the 13th child in the family and raised in Waxahachie, Texas. Her family lived on the edge of poverty, picking cotton in a region of lynchings and a highly active Ku Klux Klan. This was black America's darkest hour. But Bessie was smart and determined. She learned to read. She got books from a local lending library and read to her family at night. First the Bible, then Uncle Tom's Cabin, and books about Booker T. Washington and Harriet Tubman. She finished the eighth grade and a term at a black normal school in Oklahoma. Back in Waxahachie, she did laundry and dreamt of a larger life. During World War I, she packed off to Chicago. For four years, she worked as a manicurist and read about the new heroes of flight in France. She wanted to fly, but no American flying school would have her. So she mastered French in night school. She saved her money and in 1921 sailed for France. She managed to enroll in the Caudron Brothers' famous school of aviation. There she flew Newports, the same airplane my father had so loved to fly when he flew in France two years before her. Like him, she described the smell of castor oil and the heat of the engine. She graduated in 1922 and returned to America. It was now a different country for her. She'd been licensed to fly by the best. She joined into the community of black intellectuals in the Harlem of the 20s, and she hatched a plan to set up her own flying school. Next year, she was back in Europe, drumming up support for the idea. Anthony Fokker entertained her in Holland. He showed her his airplane factories and vowed his support. Former German pilots entertained her in Berlin. She barnstormed America to raise money for the project. She became a darling of the white press. Back in Texas in 1925, she did air shows in Houston and Dallas. She went back to Waxahachie for a show. The gates and bleachers were to be segregated. She drew a line. No show unless black and white entered by the same gate. Of course, the bleachers stayed segregated. 1926 found her scouting a parachute jump site in Jacksonville. The controls of her Curtis Jenny locked. The plane spun, and she fell 2,000 feet to her death. She was only 30, and all that remained of Bessie Coleman, hanging in the clear air above her, was a huge legacy of loving life and an inspiration to us all. Today, James Herman Banning. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. James Banning was born in 1899. Like his contemporary, Bessie Coleman, he was black, he'd lived in Oklahoma, and he became a famous pilot. His family moved to Iowa when he was 20. He studied some electrical engineering at Iowa State, then set up an auto repair shop in Ames. But he was bitten by the flying bug, and he struggled to get into flying school. Since he was black, schools kept turning him away. Finally, a former army pilot who ran a school in Des Moines accepted him. Banning became the first black flyer licensed by the U.S. Department of Commerce. On the eve of the Great Depression, he moved to L.A. to serve as chief pilot for the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. That flying school had been founded by visionary black pilot William Powell. Powell strongly argued that, in the language of those times, the sky would give the Negro a door into freedom. With Banning and their students, he fought the uphill battle to raise funds, not just for the club, but for airplane manufacturing and air service as well. While Banning taught flying, he also barnstormed in a plane he'd named Miss Ames after Ames, Iowa. In 1932, he set out with a mechanic, Thomas Allen, to be the first black pilot to fly across America. This time, they flew an Alexander Eagle Rock, a two-seat biplane that had come out six years before. 
It was now yesterday's airplane, so Banning and Allen rebuilt its engine, adding new magnetos and cannibalizing valves from a Nash automobile. They set out without enough money for gas and oil, calling themselves the Flying Hobos. When they reached Yuma, the airport attendant said, Aren't you the same pilot who landed here two years ago and blew a tire? Banning allowed he was. The man remembered how Banning made a perfect three-point landing before he hit badly laid concrete on the runway. You, the man told him, are why we now have an up-to-date airport. Well, said Banning, that should be worth a tank of gas. And so it went. After 21 days, 42 hours in the air, they reached Long Island's Valley Stream Airport. Their 3,300-mile trip was an accomplishment that must be weighed against the skein of adversities they'd overcome. A few months later, Banning was scheduled to fly an exhibition at Camp Kearney, California. Bad weather delayed the show for several days. When it cleared, a Navy pilot offered to fly him over from Lindbergh Field to check the gathering crowd. There, the pilot decided to show off for his now-famous passenger. He pulled into a steep climb from near ground level in front of the stands. The plane stalled, couldn't recover, and crashed. Both were killed. Powell raged at his friend's death. God poured forth his wrath, he wrote. Well, Banning, like Bessie Coleman before him, died in a dangerous business. He'd waged his war with history on two fronts. He lost the one in the air, but only after he'd made huge strides in his other fight, the one against prejudice on the ground below. Ask anyone about black Americans in World War II, and you hear about the Tuskegee Airmen those courageous fighter pilots who guarded American bombers so well late in the war. The story of another unit of black soldiers is far less well known because they functioned in secrecy. Their story began in 1944 when the Army agreed to form the 555th Airborne Battalion, a unit of black paratroopers. Like the Tuskegee Airmen, the 555th, or Triple Nickel, had to fight prejudice and foot-dragging from all sides. They took only the best, and other units wouldn't let their best transfer into it. Passive resistance by the Army kept it below full strength. The Battle of the Bulge came and went that winter in Europe while black soldiers chafed to get into the 555th. Only as the war wound down in the spring did the unit finally reach battalion strength. But now the Japanese had unleashed their secret weapon. Balloon bombs rode the jet stream all the way from Japan and landed randomly across Western America. The military couldn't hide that completely, but they shrouded most of it in secrecy. The bombs actually killed only six people. A woman and five children were fishing near Bly, Oregon, and they chanced to find one of the bombs. It exploded as they tried to figure out what it was. The one place the bombs were effective was in starting forest fires. The Forest Service had just introduced smoke jumping in 1939 and was still working out its techniques. In May, orders reached the 555th. The battalion was to be trimmed to a company of 160 men. Only the best of the best were chosen. They were sent not to Europe, but secretly to Pendleton, Oregon. There, they were to be retrained as smoke jumpers. Much was different. The military trained to come down in open terrain. Smoke jumpers expect to land in trees, and they train to lower themselves to the ground when they do. The triple nickel began jumping into fires in the summer of 45. The Jim Crow mentality was still alive in Oregon, but the community of pilots and firefighters was colorblind. They were all in it together. So the men of the 555th made 1,200 individual jumps into fires. As they honed this embryonic firefighting technique, they suffered burns, broken bones, asphyxiation, and the first smoke-jumping fatality. Malvin Brown landed in a tree near Roseburg, Oregon, where I finished high school two years later, and he fell to his death. I worked on a road survey crew in the Virgin Douglas fir that he died to protect. I remember those noble 200-foot trees, and I shudder at the idea of trying to descend on a rope from a parachute tangled in the top branches. The Triple Nickel Saga makes a powerful story of swords to plowshares. These were some of the least known World War II heroes, serving their country unrecognized under truly battlefield conditions and doing it without firing a shot. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. <laughs>